this video is coming from Sunday churches. What? You gonna sit in this porn sexual churches with your children? You want Christ in you, the hope of glory that the Bible says, or you want the devil in you, the hope of demons? The word Protestant simply means Protestants, Sunday churches, they are forefathers. They used to protest against Roman Catholic Church. They are false doctrine during dark ages. But unfortunately, Vatican II 1960s was the time the Roman Catholic, they plan how they can destroy Reformation or bring all the Sunday churches back to them. Because Revelation chapter 17 says Roman Catholic Church is the mother of Harlot. If this church is mother of harlot, it means that this church has a daughters. So they infiltrate all the Sunday churches. This is the way they decide to destroy Sunday churches. They decide to bring false music and sexual dance in Sunday churches. I can't believe these people can go so far like this. A lady who's singing uh, Jennifer Hudson's song, and it's so bad that she cusses in church. I'm not living without you. I don't want to be free. I'm saying you, and you, and you, you're gonna love me. Now she's cursing the church? She just cursing the church. Wow, who make her curse? The devil. Because she's singing for the devil. That's why she's cursing, says the word of God. The abundance of the heart is what the mouth speak. Watch this. When I read in the Bible where he says, as I am, I just smile and say, yes, I am too. We're gods. I am a little. Dude. I am. Jesus is the one who told Moses at the burning bush, he says, I am that I am. So in New Testament, when Jesus Christ came, he says, I am. But unfortunate. These satanic pastors, they believe they God, so they also says, I am. Wow. When I read in the Bible where he says, I am, I just smile and say, yes, I am too. That we're gods. I am a little God. I and a little revelation 16 13 to 14 and i saw three unclean spirit like frogs coming out of the mouth of dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of false prophet for they are the spirit of devils walking miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of god almighty Watch this. I'm not a witch. I'm a witch for Jesus. You are what? You are a foul devil. Do you know who you are talking to? Foul devil. Where is the foul fingers? Say to the face. <laughs> what? Slap. I'm not for violence against women. And he smacked the mess out of her and all she did was she just fixed her team natural hair and she took it like i'm not a witch who are you but i'm witch for jesus jesus I mean, has no witches you are a devil you are not set for deliverance and you are free to go to hell <laughs> that's the coldest line ever you are free to go to hell like he didn't try to call the demon out he didn't try to pray for her he smacked her and then told her to go to hell <laughs> <laughs> what is she supposed to get delivered for? He's speaking a false tongue that Revelation 16 verse 13 to 14 says, and then he cursed in the church. All these Roman Catholic Church pastors that are infiltrating Sunday churches secretly, they destroy Sunday churches, they make a fun about Jesus Christ, and then they make a fun about Sunday churches. 
Notice what the word of God says in Isaiah chapter 28, verse 14 to 15. Notice. Wherefore hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men that rule this people which is in Jerusalem. Because ye have said, We have made a covenant with dead and with hell, are we at agreement? When the overflowing scorn shall pass through, it shall not come to us, for we have made lies our refuge, and on the falsehood have we hid ourselves. Now Jesus applied to this false shepherd, Isaiah 28 verse 18, notice what Jesus says, And your covenant with dead shall be disnewed, and your agreement with her shall not stand. When the overflowing scorn shall pass through, then you shall be trodden down by it. Now be sure to get this straight. to ourselves don't leave us to yes. our foolish thinking lord we want all that you have all yes. all that you have yes we thank you hallelujah hallelujah to that highly publicized prediction the world did not end over the weekend which means a number of preachers who live like rock stars will get to continue living the good life how good here's lisa guerrero and the i squad with a look at some who've been preaching prosperity who are living large fresh wind fresh they are some of the most popular tv preachers in the country here. They urge the faithful followers to donate generously, and in return, the Lord will bring them prosperity. I'm not going to be going to heaven and be broke when I get there. And there's no denying some people have prospered handsomely. Wow! The now pastors themselves, the they live like rock stars, with huge mansions, private jets, and fancy cars. Their lifestyles are so lavish, six of them have been investigated by the U.S. Senate. Like Paula White, who lives in multi-million dollar homes in New York City and Tampa, Florida. And Creflo Dollar, he gets around in style, flying in private jets to preach around the country. He owns this mansion in an exclusive Atlanta suburb. Mr. Dollar, how do you... Not one of them would agree to an interview about their opulent lifestyle. How did you justify your million dollar mansions in your jets to all of your donors, sir. Oh, yeah. But when it comes to opulence, few religious leaders compare to Kenneth Copeland. You and I are supposed to always have. To show you his house, we rented this helicopter so you can see his 18,000 square foot mansion valued at over $6 million. He lives in this home outside Fort Worth, Texas. It has beautiful water views and comes complete with a boathouse. But that's not all. 
Copeland is an avid pilot, and here's his pride and joy, a $20 million Cessna Citation jet. It's the fastest private jet money can buy. He said he needed it to better serve the Lord, and proudly did a flyby for his followers after the church bought it. Shout it! But it's not just one plane. We found a fleet of planes registered to the church. And you won't catch him waiting in line at the airport because he's got his own, the Kenneth Copeland Airport, located right next to his mansion. I think Copeland is unbelievably greedy. Ole Anthony heads the Trinity Foundation, a religious watchdog group that worked closely with the Senate committee investigating Copeland and other TBB preachers. Televangelism alone is at least a two and a half to three billion dollar industry untaxed, unregulated. That's right. By law, religious groups like Copeland's are exempt from federal taxes and they don't have to report how they spend their money to anyone. Amen. Copeland's church takes in tens of millions a year through donations and selling books and DVDs to his donors. She sent them a lot of money, a, a whole lot of money. When Christy Parker's mother died of cancer, she found diaries that showed her mother sent Copeland most of her life savings, hoping her faith and donations would cure her of her terminal disease. What do you think of Kenneth Copeland's lifestyle? TV doesn't do it justice. Their office furniture is probably worth more than most people's houses. It makes you sick. Oh my. Copeland refused our request for an interview, so we caught up with him at an event in North Carolina. Now, why you're living such a lifestyle of luxury off of church donations? Ma'am, I don't think we have time for this. Thank you. Thank you. Why won't you answer our questions? A hotel employee tried to prevent us from taping. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on. Come here. It's just a simple question, sir. Yes, and I'm going to give you a simple answer. Thank you. My lifestyle follows the scripture we give, we believe, we're open. You have a fleet of private jets. Why is that necessary? You're a minister. How many private jets do you have? Right after that, he walked away. Although Copeland says he cooperated with the Senate investigation, the Senate committee disagreed, saying only two television preachers did, Joyce Myers and Benny Hinn. And the committee recommended that the IRS investigate further. They set up new world order so that they can control the world and bring everybody on the Roman Catholic Church. The affirmative task we have now is to create a new world order. Now we can see a new world coming into view. A world in which there is the very real prospect of a new world order. That I offered myself that we needed a new world order. Pope Benedict XVI is calling for a new world financial order in the third encyclical of his pontificate. Globalized economy. The document was released just hours before the G8 summit. So notice. Now Roman Catholic Church leaders or papacy are controlling every president and Sunday pastors around the world so now they're pushing a gay agenda in churches and outside the church. Leviticus 18.22 Thou shalt not align with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. Jude 1.7 Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the city about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Watch this. When President Obama uh, came out in support of gay marriage, we announced it, we celebrated it, we applauded it in this congregation because we have spent years trying to teach this congregation that God loves everybody. We want to be on record that the NAACP now firmly opposes all efforts to restrict marriage equality. Civil marriage, like all civil rights provided by the government, 
must be provided equally to all. And like it's crazy because like a lot of these pastors, especially in the black churches, like they get up and they just talk about like gay people and, and how gay people are, are wrong and bad. And and half of them are gay itself, you know. What I'm that's I said that in jest, but that's no, an but that's underlying. Interesting. That's what yeah, that's a, we don't do weird stuff. Now, the other hip, 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 hypocritical aspect of that is our churches, Kira, are filled with same gender loving people from the from the music department to the pulpits. Black music, church music, where would it be without our same gender loving or gay musicians and singers? Not all of them are. But many of them have come to you and said, can't come oh, out. Yes. Oh, yes. And we're yeah. talking very powerful people yes, in the gospel ma industry. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. With tears in their eyes, they were afraid. There are people who come to me and say, I embrace your gospel of inclusion, Bishop, but I can't. It's not a theological issue with me. It's a business decision. I'll lose my flock. I'll use my money. I'll lose my parsons. I'll lose myself. I can't love everybody. I can't even love me, he could say. And I want to, I want to say to that group, and this is a wake-up call. Until the church, the church, black or otherwise, confronts, not combats, confronts this issue of human sexuality and homosexuality, which is not going away. Homosexuals and homosexuality are going on away. If every gay person in our church is left, or those who have an orientation or a preference or an inclination or fantasy, if everyone left, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have a church. <laughs> this is, that's interesting. Or fantasy, if everyone left, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have a church. <laughs> this is, that's interesting. Yeah, there are gay doctors, police officers, attorneys. Look at the whole Catholic Church. About gays in the church. Um, your take on gays in the church, um, should they be allowed? Of course, it might seem like, a, of course, an easy answer. And if so, um, should gays be um, able to participate in the worship service? Pastor Dahl. Yes. Yes, to what question? They should. <laughs> They are. It's not. <laughs> um, they should be allowed. Jesus, again, he says, whosoever will, let him come. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, should they be allowed to come or should they be allowed to participate in the worship service? They I participate was... in worship service now. Participating in church. It's from the back door to the front door. It's, <laughs> it's nothing new, but, uh, but it's existing now. I mean, every, I don't say every church, but every church I've been to. Hello guys, what is going on in the Presbyterian Church? It's become the Lesbian Church of the USA. These two women, Reverend Casey Clark Porter and the Reverend Holly Clark Porter, were ordained, co-ordained last week as joint ministers in the Presbyterian Church of the USA. And they are married to each other. The sad thing is, these two young women, one of them still in her 20s, they were married to men and they divorced their husbands after meeting each other in, se in the seminary, in the Presbyterian Bible School. And only a few short days after the Presbyterian Church changing its constitution to allow same-sex marriage, these guys, well girls, who have, who have been married for some time are now both pastors, ministers in the so-called church, the Lesbian, Pres Lesbian Church. This is trampling the, trampling the blood of Jesus underfoot. Here they are administering communion. I mean, this breaks my heart. Uh, even, even their own wedding photographs show you that deep down they believe there ought to be one male and one female in a marriage. Otherwise they wouldn't both, they wouldn't be dressed as a man and a woman. One is the assistant minister at that church, and the other is a minister at a church called the Big Gay Church. Uh, I, I've been in ministry, uh, and I've been in the church uh, where we had homosexuals serving in ministry, and and it wasn't a problem for uh, our pastors. I mean, if we had that kind of thing happening in the church, we wouldn't have nobody serving in leadership.
says Jesus, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrite! For ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. Ye neither go in yourself, neither suffer them that are entering to go in. Watch this. But look at this next video. This pastor is the one with the microphone, okay? She said, you got something to say. This is what he has to say. Now pay close attention. I'm going to let the whole thing play through and then we'll talk about it. The rest of these seven days that she's here, any of you that come and any of our friends that come, we need to be deeply respectful. We need to show an intense love to them. But above all of those things, we need to spend all of our time at the deepest place of prayer, praying that God indeed would protect all those who hear this false message that comes from her lips. Because God's message is not miracles, but that the shed blood of Jesus Christ would cleanse humble sinners. And when miracles are emphasized, Jesus is denied. Sir. Okay, guess what? Go, I didn't say it, they did. You, you all heard the word that he spoke. You are removed from my tent. No, oh, not to come to my church. No, 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 no. No, 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 don't touch him, don't touch him, don't touch him. Please be removed from my tent. I like the way this pastor exposed her false messages. Now she's going to cast him out from the church, says the apostle Paul. Have I then become your enemy? Because I tell you the truth. Isaiah 66 verse 5. Hear the word of the Lord, ye that tremble at his word. Your bread and I hit you, that cast you out for my name's sake, says, let the Lord be glorified, but he shall appear to your joy, and they shall be ashamed. Your engine is not revving up. You know what you need? You need a Holy Ghost enema right up your rear end. Benny Hinn wife also cursing the church. I told you, said Jesus. A boundless of the heart is what the mouth speak. If your engine is not revving up, you know what you need? You need a Holy Ghost enema right up your rear end. Matthew 7 verse 15 to 18. Beware of false prophet which come to you in sheep clothing, but inwardly they are robbing the wolves. You shall know them by their fruit. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of tisters? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. This pastor is telling their listeners to not go on their knees and pray to Jesus Christ by faith, but he's telling his members to put their hand on their magic healing TV. Draw a little closer. Put your hands out toward your television screen. Your Holiness, on behalf of all of us gathered here today, indeed on behalf of all the people of our beloved nation, we welcome you back to America. We're here at Blessed Sacrament Parish, we are Change LA, to meet someone who has been nicknamed the Black Pope. He's actually the Jesuit general and uh, his name is Very Reverend Adolfo Nicholas S.J. We're here to say hi and talk to him about his nickname and uh, his uh, extreme oath of the Jesuits. You just came out of a campaign, election, and the inauguration of a new president. We have been exposed to one year and a half of words and words and words, or even religious words, because also religious words have been manipulated. I am so happy we have a, a financial crisis. Hello, I really, really enjoyed your service. Thank you so much. I was wondering, I had a couple of questions. I was wondering if you could clear something up for me. Maybe later, because... Uh, oh, just, real, just really quick. Why do they call you the Black Pope? Oh, that's 
Uh, they started in the 19th century. Did it really? Yeah, but I don't like it because, because no. it's in terms of power. No, no? Yeah. I thought that the general the judges had a lot of power, but he, he, he wears black, so black folk. Oh, make well, the, yeah. I'm not folk, and, and you don't I have, have no a power. Fish on you. And, and I see that there's a lot of liberal symbols here. Um, one of the things in your in your Jesuit high oath, I think it is, it says something about. Furthermore, you promised to declare that we'll, at the first opportunity, um, seek war at any opportunity against heretics, Protestants, liberals. See here, and that that uh, you will spare neither age nor sex nor what, condition, what, what and I will hang, mean? waste, boil, flay. You've never seen that. this before. No, I've never seen it. Strangle, bury alive, oh, and it's horrible. It's and I was like, it. look, it's. It's in the congressional record. But he was very confused. He didn't. He'd never seen it before. I told him it was in the congressional record. He he said that he might talk to me later about it. But there, there's a big line. So do we want to wait and talk to him later about it? Uh, just so that you know what I was asking him. I furthermore promise and declare that I will, when opportunity presents to make wage relentless war, secretly or openly, against all heretics, Protestants, and liberals, as I am directed to, to extirpate and exterminate them from the face of the whole earth, and that I will spare neither age, sex, or condition, and that I will hang, waste, boil, flay, strangle, and bury alive these infamous heretics rip up the stomachs and wombs of their women and crush their infants' heads against the walls in order to uh, annihilate forever the ex exorable race. And then it goes on to say some other stuff. But you can look this up. It's on the Internet. I, I just want to read this on camera real quick. Just trying to find a private moment. He okay, said that I could talk to him afterwards. Okay, when the line was not too right. busy. You need to go outside with all that. Okay. Because right now he's not going to read nothing because he's going to go somewhere else. Oh. Excuse me. So thank you. Okay. Do you think we were bothering you? I think so. With your letter. Okay. okay. We can't have that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. He's just trying to clear something up. I know. But. This I'm tired of people saying Christianity is a crutch. It's not a crutch, it's a cross. This planet is covered in blood as a consequence of people who stood for righteousness and truth. Is there a bra in the house? Is there a bra? Oh, they didn't per. That's almost percolated. That's almost percolated. Look, there's panties all over the place. I see boy shorts. I shouldn't be thinking about this right now. I should be able to interpret the word and the message not be thinking about you got boy shorts on mother's born what are y'all doing y'all are y'all are y'all are talking y'all are whispering but y'all ain't drop kicking nobody okay no bras back on oh man i feel weird somebody should <laughs> where are the ushers with the blankets there ain't no usher to blanket this See, there's our booty again. <laughs> wow, you, she almost broke her neck. All, all up in her drawers, all up in her drawers. Look at this. Standing, oh, the mother's board with the white hat, standing ovation. Where's the covering? Notice what Ellen G. Y. says in Testimonies for the Church, volume five, page 136, paragraph two. To stand in defense of true and righteousness when a majority forsake us. To fight a battle of the Lord when champions are few. This will be our great test. At that time we must gather warm from the coldness of others. Courage from their cowardice and loyalty from their treason. The nation will be on the side of the great rebel leader. God says those we're going to protest or we're going to stand for the truth in these last days. The word of God is clear that we don't have to use harsh or cutting words. Let the word of God do the cutting and rebuking. That's what Ellen G. White, pen of inspiration says. 
So says the Apostle Paul, foolish Galatians who bewitch you not to believe the truth. Jesus Christ is the one who died for the whole world and he's drawn everybody to himself. But this power, they don't want you to go to Jesus Christ. They want you to go to them and confess your sin to them. So notice what Revelation chapter 18 says. And they also infiltrate the kings, presidents. So notice. And he cried mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen and is fallen. And it's become the habitation of devils and the whole of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of her fornications. And notice, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchant of the earth are wax rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Notice what it says in verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sin, that you receive not her plagues, for her sin has reached unto heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. God is calling you to come out of all this abominable, fallen Babylon, satanic churches. When a Catholic Jesuit learn Sunday churches, their doctrine, and they draw all their churches to so-called the mother of the church because they know their doctrine and they can answer questions and preach. So the members of the Sunday churches, they think that all the pastors are faithful pastors. So now it's all about my pastor says, my pastor says, my pastor says. And this is the crying that a lot of times you hear from them. Instead of them to study, to show thyself approved, just like Bible says, they make it the flesh, they are right on. And some of them, when they learn the Sabbath truth, that is always Saturday, because their pastors has been hematized them for so many years. So when they go and they talk to their pastors, Instead of them to talk to God and make decision based on that says the Lord, they make their pastors make decision for them because that's how bad they hematize them. They come right out and state exactly how they infiltrate any religious group they want. They'll come in pretending to be a Pentecostal, pretending to be a Baptist, taking the leadership role and then completely subverting it from the inside. Watch this. Holiness, may I present Archbishop Kayan Barsanian, primate of the Eastern Diocese of the Armenian Church in America. According to ecumenical protocol, the Eastern Orthodox would be first in, in the Catholic Church's ecumenical responsibility. Holiness, may I present Archbishop Yichen Akashi. The legate and ecumenical officer of the Eastern Diocese of the Armenian Church in America and president of the National Council of Churches in the United States. Holding this, may I present President Dr. Donald McCoy, representing the presiding Bishop Mark Hansen of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Holding this, may I present Bishop Jeremiah J. Park. Bishop of the New York Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church. Your Holiness, may I present Reverend Wesley Granberg Michelson, the General Secretary of the Reformed Church in America. Your Holiness, may I present Reverend Dr. Clifton Kirkpatrick, the stated clerk of the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church in the United States. Your Holiness, may I present Reverend Dr. William J. Shaw, President of the National Baptist Convention, United States. Your Holiness, may I present Bishop James Leggett, General Superintendent of the International Pentecost Holiness Church. Your Holiness, may I present Dr. Leith Anderson, President of the National Association of Evangelicals. Your Holiness, may I present Bishop David H. Benke, President of the Atlantic District of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Your Holiness, may I present Reverend Dr. A.R. Bernard, Sr., President of the Council of Churches of the City of New York. You understand the language, Your Holiness, and this is how they call this power. 
he think he is God. That's what their teachings is all about. Friends, religious leaders, when they come to meet this power, they weren't black. Notice, dark color. They represent the sinners, and he represent God. And now listen to what Bible says. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. This is the chapter the Protestant Sunday churches, their forefathers, they used to protest against this power during dark ages and they call them antichrist notice antichrist but now you don't hear from sunday churches anymore because they betray their forefathers let's start from verse 3 notice second thessalonians chapter 2 let no one deceive you by any means for that day will not come unless the fallen away comes first and the man of sin is revealed the son of predation who opposes and exalt himself above all that is called God, all that is worshipped, so that he sit as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you this things, and now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. Notice what it says in verse 7. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, Pope Francis met with the ecumenical and interreligious delegates March 20th, who had attended his inaugural Mass the day before. The representatives included Christian, Jewish, Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu, Sikh, and Jain leaders. Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew of Constantinople also had a private meeting with the new Pope. A church service is interrupted by a heated dispute over money. The fight over church leadership and finances at St. Michael Baptist Church in Laplace was captured on video and posted to YouTube. And WDSU reporter Gina Swanson is on your side with why the house of worship has now become a house divided. It's a scene you don't expect to see at a Sunday church service, a fight in the pulpit. It's a disgrace. It was, it's uncalled for and yelling in the sanctuary, all as hymns kept playing at St. Michael Baptist Church. This house of worship has become a house divided. Members say it's the result of a dispute that started with questions over the church's finances. I think they have a lot of preachers using the church for personal gain. We, we asked questions uh, regarding finances and it was told to us, take what I give you, or you don't like what I'm giving you, go back where you came from. And for those who did raise concerns. We can't fellowship like we want because we were split out of the church, myself with 49 other members. Members have even taken the matter to court. The judge put a board of trustee to be in charge and he's just like ignored that. I hate the song Drunk in Love at this point in my life. As soon as I hear it come on, I turn the radio off. Whatever I'm listening to, it goes off. So you can understand my angst when I got this praise team singing drunken love video sent to me no less than 15 times today. Thinking, I've been thinking about your goodness, how you can be low. When I was sinking, I was sinking. You never left me alone. So Jesus, I want you now. Don't act like y'all know it. You never left me alone, so Jesus, I want you. We praise As if it couldn't get any worse, they have a rapper doing Jay Z. I said, Jesus is the truth. If I do say so myself, if I do say so myself, if I do say so myself, hold up, we the best, the next the rest. I don't want to be the living the same, but then again, it's our right to get them Christ. At the same time, we live them like we the best. Pastor instructs the members to throw their shoes at the devil. Goodbye, 2008. Devil, you and your imp have got to get out of here. I'm going to kill you. Sleek of me, Satan. Ah, devil, I got something that I got to throw at you. I got to let you know for everything you did, now I get it, you know, I'm all for the symbolism, but here's problem number one. The Bible says, okay, here it is, 2 Corinthians 10 and 4, one of my favorite scriptures, by the way, and it reads, 
For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. What does that mean? It means you wouldn't use actual physical weapons against the devil. Now, mind you, the real devil wouldn't be on a mannequin. And why are the weapons of our warfare not carnal? Because these people's aim is atrocious. Okay, let's just take a look at some of these people. They have the worst aim ever. You're supposed to throw your shoes at the devil. He's got the one guy who tries to hand him his shoe, and he's like, no, you got to throw your own shoe. These people are missing the devil by a mile, okay? Miles! Now, you're not going to get many chances. I mean, they've hit the cameraman with the, with the shoes. They've hit everything but the devil. I mean, at the... I'm also going to start with a mark of the beast that they already have in White House. So be more patient, and all they have to do is enforce their law. And the whole thing is combined with religion. The Bible says the mark of the beast means this power has a mark. The beast is a language that God is using for this power. And they themselves, they says in their own book, the book of Catechism, the old version, notice, they says Sunday worship is their mark of authority. The new version, they don't use the word authority, but at least, thank God, they still admit it. Even the new version of Catechism, they still says they changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. Friends, the mark of the beast is not worldly speculations that sometimes you hear. Some people says, well, it's computer chip. Unfortunately, you don't find in the Bible. And some people says, you know, it's 666. But according to Revelation 13 verse 18, actually 666 help you to find the beast. What I mean is to identify the beast. But the Bible says the mark. The reason why I repeat and I kind of stretch it because I don't want you to miss it. It's a deception. Notice the mark of the beast it's clear it's not a mark that anybody can see it's a spiritual mark means they belong to the devil means they have cast their allegiance or they have given their allegiance to pope the antichrist daniel chapter 7 verse 17 says the four beasts which thou saw are the four kings who reign on the earth Babylon is the first kingdom, Medo-Persia Empire was the second kingdom, and Greece, third kingdom, Rome, fourth kingdom. So when Revelation 13 verse 18 says, here is wisdom, let him who have understand, calculate the number of the beast, is a number of a man. His number is 666. So according to Revelation 13 verse 18, 666 help you to identify the beast. Roman Catholic, Roman numerals, some of them have a value, some of them doesn't. But when you put all of them together, it end up to 666. Constantine changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday, but unfortunately, Sunday churches, they adopt sun worship day for so many years. They don't want to get rid of it, but actually it's a pagan sun worship day day sunday worship look even the spellings you'll find out matter of fact if you look at your calendar sunday is always begin as the first day of the week unfortunately they will skip and some people they don't know they will count monday as the first day of the week because according to revelation chapter 12 verse 9 the devil will deceive the whole world so it's a deception so the devil you know he's in the process blinding the, the people including the christian though Friends, if you go to church Sunday, notice the first day church, now you don't have the mark of the beast according to Revelation 14 and 13 unless the law is in enforced. That's why now you hear different countries, they try to force the people to now sell 
or do anything on Sunday because they try to enforce the law. But according to Bible, notice, United States is the one who's going to cause the whole world to worship. The beast, they are sun worship day, means Sunday worship, according to Revelation 13. So whenever United States enforce the law, and every country also going to enforce because they control the whole world. Every president on the Roman Catholic Church. We know according to history, Jesus Christ rose from the dead Sunday. So even his dead body, he kept the Sabbath. Just like the Bible says, all things was made by him. When he finished his work, the end of creation, according to Genesis chapter 2 verse 1 to 3, he kept the Sabbath. And also... When he finished his work of redemption, he says it is finished and he kept the Sabbath, even his dead body. And he rose from the dead Sunday that the Bible says was the first day of the week. According to Luke chapter 24 verse 1 to 3, friends, Saturday is always the Sabbath. The seventh day of the week. Notice, and again, it's always Saturday. And that's why the Bible says the seventh day is the Sabbath. Jewish nation, even though I'm not Jewish, they still keep the Sabbath, Saturday. And also, Encyclopedia, you will find it even different language. If you speak Spanish, Sabado means Saturday. Friends, this is a beautiful time in history because we only one step away from heaven. The mark of the beast, the worship issue in Revelation chapter 13. If you get time, read it because Revelation chapter 13 verse 12, it's a worship issue and verse 15, it's a worship issue and verse 8 is a worship issue. And the Bible helps us to understand that behind the scene, Revelation 13 is the devil. He wants the whole world to worship him. Friends, you have to escape. You have to study your Bible. Christ is calling you, whether you are Christian or not. Whenever you hear Sunday worship in any countries, do not accept it. God is going to protect you. Bible says our bread and water will be sure. According to Revelation 16, whenever National Sunday Law or Sunday Law come to history, if you accept Sunday Law, you're going to receive the wrath of God that is poured out without mixture. That's why God is warning the whole world right now that we don't have to receive the mark of the beast. TB Joshua would engage all known mind control techniques to keep his disciples in check. Sleep deprivation was his standard and the cruel punishments he meted out for the slightest offenses were calculated to induce fear. Snitching was the order of the day and he had the ability to disorientate the best of men. Disciples dared not converse freely for fear of punishments. Gradually, the disciples would be led into working out his deceptions to fool the public becoming tools in his propaganda machine. I was made a prophet in June 12, 1999 on his birthday. From then, the powers invested in me increased. I became a terror to co-disciples. People run away from me because I will do whatever he asks me to do. Any disciple he asks me to slap, I will slap. That the genuine church was also involved in some of the same tricks to a lesser degree? How many more ministers like Chris Oyahilume did he taint with the spirit of deception? So now this all caught satanic worshippers singing for the devil by small screen
they use Jesus Christ's name pretend like they Christians says the Word of God they have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof for search turn away hey be Shondo God we came to praise you we came to lift you up we came to magnify your holy name Hey, because truly the name of the Lord is a high tower. The righteous run in, and they are saved. Hey, let a spirit of encouragement sweep over your people. And that's not enough. We got to speak in tongues like the Holy Ghost Enforcer. Savior, Mighty God, Ishkatai, Yabrobo, Isha, Arobo, Osha, Atayai, Arobo, Osha, Katai. What I'm saying is we got to pray. Roman Catholic papacy or court leaders is spreading Indians herd that is sacrificed for the devils. Mesh originally came from Indians. Many have no hesitation in giving the only thing they possess. A man. Yeah, not too bad, not too bad, my friend. It's a wonderful day here in Rome. Freezing. But it's beautiful. And uh, yeah, I spoke to the office earlier on. They said there's uh, some hair coming in. Yeah, that's really good because I think it was in Fiumicino right now being uh, disinfested. And uh, I think they're delivering it today. Can you send me an email with the lengths and the number of cartons, please? All right, so listen, when am I going to see you when you come into Rome? Really? But keep that hair coming, bro. Keep that hair coming. That's it, man. Keep it flowing like the River Nile. 100 kilos of hair, and it cost us about uh, approximately about 100,000 US dollars. Oh, fantastic. Okay, great. Man, you work on that immediately and send it back ASAP, as soon as you can. That's right, that's right. You better keep that a secret, yeah? Exactly. <laughs> all over the world, my friend, all over the world. Listen, I've seen, I've seen your uh, new prices. Okay, we just have to make some calculations because, of course, the prices are, uh, are very high. Yeah, yeah, no, this is understood. I mean, the, the quality is undisputable. I mean, we were really, really happy with the quality, so that's, uh, that goes without saying. Because I understand the difficulty in supplying uh, only long hair. Uh, basically, what happens is that the supplier is left with tons of short hair. Sagita Wadwani, executive editor of Hello Magazine. Welcome to Young Turks. Thank you. Okay, Sagita, 10 years in the business. How's the journey been for you? I joined with Elle and uh, it was a very dynamic, very competitive team. Everybody was scrambling to make it to be the next big editor. And I learned a lot over there. I learned about, uh, it's basically, it's a women's magazine and we could read 29 editions from all over the world. The women were changing all over at the same time. Style can cost up to four thousand dollars, but for stars, it's as fabulous as you can get. Great lengths are the Rolls Royce of hair extensions. They're the creme de la creme of hair. Which is why every stunning starlet, from Cameron Diaz to Kate Beckinsale to Celine Dion, is wearing these top tresses. But what makes this hair so great? It's made from uncolored, never treated hair. And this hair is then collected from these sacred temples in India, shipped off to Hollywood. Now, a white preacher would say it like this, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Can I get a witness? That's white. 
But if I preach at one of the brothers' churches, one of the bishops, and God, mm -hmm, I say, the Lord, ha. Oh, you ain't hearing me, believe I'll go over here a while. And the Lord, hey! Hey! Oh, hey! And God is able. solo lady spinning around boom usher oh i'm doing my usher thing right now oh moonwalk on you look at this hill toe i'm a hill toeing for the crips on the set michael jackson side to side this is another michael jackson this dude is going ham come on today's sunday law news report features an interesting news item that ought to make you sit up and pay close attention now Take a look at this. It's a massive encounter with the Pope. The family's coming from five continents for this special pilgrimage and some one-on-one -on -one time with the Bishop of Rome himself. This morning, the Pope is once again breaking from tradition. This time at an annual event for families where 150,000 families from 70 countries join the Pope in Rome to profess their faith. Now, for the first time, hundreds of children and elderly people are standing side by side with the Pope. Instead of in the audience, emphasizing the importance of different generations. The Pope saying rest. Saturday, so many families are there. The Vatican City wants to be known as the capital of the family. The Pope says he'll close out the event, blessing all families around the world. What an event, huh? And quite an event. You know, it's really interesting. There was a report out this morning that says tourism in Rome has actually gone up no since kidding. this Pope yeah, arrived. His popularity wow. continues to rise. Amazing. Great to see you, Gio. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Who doesn't want a social day devoted to families? Who doesn't desire a day where the emphasis is on love for our family and everyone else's? It's a great idea in light of the current attack on traditional family values. But let's take a closer look at this, shall we? When we shine the light of the gospel onto this new satanic effort to recognize Sunday as the day of rest, we'll see that this is just the beginning of persecution for Sabbath keepers. First world meeting of families took place in 1994 and subsequent annual meetings took place in Rio de Janeiro, Rome, Manila, uh, Milan, and again last year in Rome. The Pope has appointed the next family day meeting to be held in Philadelphia in 2015. Now friend, what does all this mean? What is this family day all about? The Pope desires that all families have a work-free Sunday. Families should be free from work so that on Sunday, children could be together with their parents and relatives and go to church as well. The Pope also suggests that we should discover the true meaning of Sunday observance on this family day. The good news of the family is a very important witness of evangelization, which Christians can communicate to everyone by being witnesses to life. He said the church must give attention and show spiritual closeness. It's interesting that the UN and the Vatican are working together for this family day, which will be each and every Sunday. Families will have a rest upon this day, be together with the children and go to church and so on. Do you see the strategy? The Pope desires to promote Sunday as the day of rest for all families throughout the world. He calls Sunday the family day. The previous Pope Benedict said, and I quote, by defending Sunday one defends human freedom. Benedict said this during his weekly general audience in St. Peter's Square just after he had 
attended a family day gathering in Milan, Italy. Pope Paul so said, and I quote, Sunday must be a day of rest for everyone, so people can be free to be with their families and with God. The Pope clearly stated that he wanted to come to the defense of free time, which is threatened by a kind of bullying, he says, through demands of work. He continued, Sunday is a day of the Lord and of a man, and of man a day which everyone must be able to be free, free for the family and free for God. This is in the Catholic News Service, June 2012. There it is, friend, straight from the beast himself. Friend, this is so crystal, crystal clear. The next step is the enforcement of a Sunday law. Everything else is now in place. Everyone else is on board and now only waiting for life to be breathed into the Sunday law. So when the Pope says that we should have Sunday as a day of rest for the family, he's promoting the counterfeit, unbiblical day of rest. Sunday means the S-U-N day and not the S-O-N day. The test lies before us whether we will worship Him who created heaven and earth and all that is in them or we will worship the beast and receive its mark. This is dealing with worship, my friend. Whom will you worship and serve? Will you have God as your authority or will you have the Pope as your authority? Will you be loyal to the Creator or will you be loyal to people and their laws against God's law? This is the test that lies right before us. May the Holy Spirit help you and may God help you as you follow Him. It's almost complete. When our founders declared a new order of the ages, they were acting on an ancient hope that is meant to be fulfilled. The Iraq war has been another foreign policy challenge, beginning with John Paul's papacy. Other foreign policy priorities for Benedict include pushing for peace in the Holy Land and decrying rising secularism in Europe. It's also been quietly working to establish relations something that was not possible during the last papacy, largely because of John Paul's role in the fall of communism in Poland. The Chinese obviously didn't want John Paul II running around China doing the same thing. Uh, Pope Benedict is, is not that kind of a threat to China. So. Most of the time, in places around the world, Vatican diplomats work outside the spotlight, where experts say they often have an advantage. Some question how much government leaders of today truly listen to what the Pope has to say. And that, observers say, is a moral authority that can't be measured by economic strength or military divisions. A moral authority Benedict hopes to draw upon when meeting with U.S. officials and speaking before the United Nations. I'm Kim Lawton in Washington. Unfortunate friends, if you don't understand their final goal, you're going to be doomed. But the good news is, if you know their final goal, you can escape what's about to happen. Some people will show you some of the secret societies, but unfortunately, they don't tell you the power behind the scene and the whole world are afraid because they don't know what to do. Today, you're going to find out. Watch the whole video. At the Vatican today, a warm greeting for President Obama from Pope Benedict the 16th. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the greeting. New world order is emerging. When really a new world order can be created, it's a great opportunity. 
Americans right now. When all who wear America's uniform remain the cornerstone of our national defense, the anchor of global security, we have to shape an international order that can meet the challenges of our generation. The international order we seek is one that can resolve the challenges of our times. A new world order is emerging. Gordon Brown's verdict as he closes the G20 summit. From America to Ethiopia, they all signed up to a trillion dollar boost for world trade. We'll have reaction around the world and ask what it means for Britain also tonight. We have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order. It is a new world order with significantly different... Well, there have been extraordinary scenes in Berlin tonight as thousands of people gathered to hear Barack Obama deliver a key foreign policy speech on his current European tour. The Democratic presidential hopeful laid out his vision for America's place in a new world order, saying he was speaking as a proud citizen. The power behind the scenes secret societies. Notice what has Skull and Bones, Illuminati, Masons, and all them groups. They have one master. Have you ever seen a youth pastor do crazy stuff to get the teens involved? Yo, teens, I'm cool. Swag for you. Turn up for the Lord. Get ratchet for Jesus. This guy takes that to a whole nother level. I have repeatedly offered $1,000 to anyone who can prove to me from the Bible alone that I am bound to keep Sunday holy. There is no such law in the Bible. It is a law of the Holy Catholic Church alone. The Bible says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The Catholic Church says, no. By my divine power, I abolish the Sabbath day and command you to keep holy the first day of the week. And lo, the entire civilized world bows down in a reverent obedience to the command of the Holy Catholic Church. T. N. Wright, C. S. S. R., in a lecture at Hartford, Kansas, February 18th, 1884. The Catholic Church for over 1,000 years before the existence of a Protestant, by virtue of her divine mission, changed the day from Saturday to Sunday. The Catholic Mirror, September 23, 1893. Question, which is the Sabbath day? Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Question, why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer, we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church in the Council of Laodicea, A.D. 336, transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Peter Geierman, the convert's 
Catechism of Catholic Doctrine, second edition, 1910, page 50. These secret societies, Roman Catholic Church leaders also infiltrate new organization of Seventh-day Adventists or SDA, the Selective Message, Volume 1, page 204, LNGY says, the conference churches are new organizations whenever you get time ready. So I'm going to give you some of the inspiration that will help you and also will help a lot of Sunday churches that is going to come to the foundation of Adventists. 1 Samuel 16 23 and it came to pass when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul that David took an herb and played with his hand so Saul was refreshed and was well and the evil spirit departed from him question if the right kind of music drive up evil spirit don't you think wrong kind of music could invite evil spirit in voice and speech and song page 420 paragraph 2 this is coming from pen of inspiration notice what Ellen G. White says there is a sound of vocal instrument music Christians are gathered there but what is that you hear it is a song a flavors deity fit for dance hall Amos chapter 5 verse 23 Take thus away from me the noise of the songs, for I will not hear the melody of thy vows. Notice what Ellen G. White says in Selective Messages, Volume 2, page 36, paragraph 2. The things you have described as taking place in Indiana, the Lord has shown me would take place just before the close of probation. Every uncle thing will be demonstrated. There will be a shout of drums, music, and dancing. The senses of rational being will become so confused that they cannot be trusted to make a right decision. And this is called the moving of the Holy Spirit. Selective Messages, Volume 2, page 36. To 37 notice continue notice the Holy Spirit never reveals itself in such method in such a bedlam of noise this is an invention of Satan to cover up his ingenious method for making of non-effect the pure sincere elevated in noble sanctifying true for this time better never have the worship of God blended with music that to use musical instrument to do the work of which last January was presented to me will be brought into our camp meetings the truth for this time need nothing of such kind in its work of converting soul a bedlam of noise shut the senses and pervert that which if conducted all right might be blessing the power of satanic agencies blame with din and noise to have a carnival and this is termed the Holy Spirit working Selective Messages, Volume 2, page 37, paragraph 2. Notice Ellen G. White continue. No encouragement should be given to this kind of washing. The same kind of influence came in after the passing of that time in 1844. The same kind of representation were made. Men become excited and were working by the power taught to be the power of God. Selective Messages, Volume 2, page 37, paragraph 3, she continue. Notice, I will not go into all the painful history. It is too much. But last January, the Lord showed me that erroneous theories and method will be brought into our camp meetings and that the history of the past will be repeated. I have greatly distressed. I was instructed to say that at this demonstration, demons in the form of men are present, working with all the ingenuity that Satan can employ to make the true disgusting to sensible people that the enemy will try to arrange matters so that the camp meetings which has been the means of bringing the truth of the third angel's message before the multitude should be lost their force and influence. Selective messages, volume 2, page 37 to 38. Notice she's continue. The Holy Spirit has nothing to do with such a confusion of noise and multitude of sounds as passing before me last January. Satan work and make the din and confusion of such music which properly conducted will be a praise and glory to God. He makes it effect like the poison stings of the serpent. 
Selective message in volume 2, page 38, paragraph 1, God should continue. Those things which has been in the past will be the future. Satan will make music a snare by the way in such it is conducted. God call upon his people who have the light before the man in the world, in the testimonies to read and consider and take heed. Clear and definite instruction has been given in order that all may understand. By the itching desire to originate something new, resort in strange doctrine and luxury destroys the influence of those who will be a power for good if they heard firm the beginning of their confidence in the truth the Lord has given them. Selective Messages, Volume 3, page 332, Paragraph 2. Notice what Ellen G. White says. It is not safe for the lost workers to take part in worldly entertainment. Association with worldliness in musical line is looked upon as harmless by some Sabbath keepers, but such ones are on dangerous ground. Now Satan seeks to lead men and women astray, and thus he has gained control of souls so smooth, so plausible as the working of the enemy that his vows are not suspected. And many church members become lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Question. How many culture music does God church have? Answer. Testimonies for the church. Volume 9. Page 181. Paragraph 1. Notice what Ellen G. White says. We have not six pardons to follow. Not five. We have only one and that is Christ Jesus. If the Italian brethren and French brethren and the Germany brethren try to be like him, they will plant their feet upon the same foundation of truth. The same spirit that dwells in one will dwell in the other. Christ in them the hope of glory. I want you brethren and sisters not to build up a wall of petition between different nationalities on the country. Seek to break it down wherever it exists. We should endeavor to bring all into the harmony that there's in Jesus. Laboring for one object is the salvation of our fellow man. Let me ask you a question. If Jesus and the apostles didn't pray war victory music in the temple of God, how much more people who are living in the time of judgment? Revelation chapter 14 verse 7 says, For the hour of his judgment is come. And we know that according to Revelation chapter 22, the day that Jesus Christ is going to come, he's going to give his reward to everyone according to his work. So the judgment take place before Jesus Christ come because you have to pass the test before you receive your reward. And the book of Hebrews says, Jesus Christ is our high priest. Let me ask you a question. Did the Old Testament church play war victory music in the time of judgment or a tournament or at one man or in the tabernacle or the temple of Jewish people? A lot of people says, well, they dance before the Lord. And also Psalm 149 and Psalm 150, the Bible says noise, voices and shout. Music that was playing in the day of David was a battery victory songs and a battery victory music. If you meet a lot of people on the stream that they're making a noise and you ask the question and says, well, why are you guys making a noise? Does anybody win something here? And they say, well, no, no, no. They want us. That's why we're making a noise. Does it make sense? New Testament church or the apostle or Jesus Christ come, nobody danced in the church. They was so reverent, so much so that they didn't make a noise in the churches because the New Testament church understand the Old Testament that a lot of people don't understand in these last days. They understand that our individual victory didn't come yet. According to Revelation chapter 15, verse 1 to 3, God's church, we're not going to have the mark of the beast at the Sunday law. We're going to have the victory over the beast and his image. So at that time, when Jesus Christ appeared after the seven last plagues, we're going to sing music. And we're going to shout a victory. We're going to go to heaven. But the victory didn't come yet. Why are you shouting if you're not winning yet? Daniel chapter 3 verse 14 to 18. 
Nebuchadnezzar speak and said unto them, It is true, o Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, not worship the golden image which I have set up? Now ye be ready that at what time ye heard the sound of the cornet flute, harp, sackbat, sorcery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made. Well, but if you worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God we have served is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. He would deliver us out of thy hand, O king. But if not, be known to thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods. Now worship the golden image which thou hast set up. God says, I am the Lord, I declare the end from the beginning. Hip-hop, reggae, jazz, blues, and all kinds of sexual devilish music that is playing in these last days is moving people one step ahead to receive the mark of the beast that is Sunday law. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 11, notice. All this thing happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wow! Upon whom the ends of the world are come in this last days? Well, you better be believe it. They changed our three inches logo 1995. They put this new logo, this is yellow six frame all C9 triangle secret society logo because they think they're going to overcome seven day Adventists. But praise the Lord, they cannot overcome those we on the foundation of Adventists. Three inches messages. Those will build in the foundation of many generations that Isaiah 58 verse 12 and also Jeremiah 6, 16 and 17. Back at chapter 2 verse 1 to 4 and Jude 1 verse 3 says, If you visit every seven day Adventist and if you don't see this two big chart that you see on the screen, don't go. Come out fast as possible because you're not going to see Seventh-day Adventist teachers or pastors. But unfortunately, you're going to see ravening wolves, Roman Catholic Church leaders that are preterned that they Seventh-day Adventists. And they're going to lead you to hell because the Bible says if a blind leads blind, they both will fall into a dish. This parable video will blow up your mind, so watch it carefully. Matthew 13:34 says that Jesus spoke to the multitudes in parables and transport a person through time as in time travel this is impossible no it is possible Russell traveled over 100 years into the future <laughs> over 100 years to the 20th no the 21st century correct you <laughs> This is an absurdity. It is the truth, Russell. No, as time travel is impossible. I'm afraid that your illness has affected your judgment more than I thought. My friend, time travel is possible. What proof can you provide? This is why I have arranged a journey for you. A journey? For me? Yes. Into the future. <laughs> oh, come now. Russell. You must see where the teaching of good morals alone will lead. You must see for yourself what happens when we remove the authority of Christ out of life.
I do not know how this will be taken by you, but I am sure this manner of dress arouses sinful passions in the customers as they walk by. Sinful passions? Yes, sinful passions of promiscuity, especially in the younger males. We must be careful as to the example we portray to our young people, for the goodness of all society. Sir, I appreciate you voicing your opinion, and I'll be sure to let my father know, and I want to thank you. But to be honest, this is the first complaint we've had like this. Our customers, most of them don't seem to mind this sort of thing. Okay? Eddie, I wanted to speak with you again about the importance of attending a local church. Oh, I go to church, yeah. Christmas, Easter. Yes, but we need to attend church more than two times a year for spiritual growth. Oh, well, you know, at least I ain't never been to the slammer. Slammer? Yeah, the big house, jail, clink, clink. Man, I thought my English was bad. But, Eddie, we need consistent Bible study and fellowship if we were to become mature spiritual men. Shh. Yeah. Jesse Gonzaga just hit a double with two men on. We're up three to two. Eddie, I'm attempting to talk to you about your spiritual life. Look, preacher man, with all due respect, I ain't no angel, but I ain't never cheated or lied or shot anybody. Ask people. Eddie Martinez is a good guy. Yes, these are all important virtues, Eddie, but it's important that we do more than just not offend each other. Yeah! We got another run. We're up four to two! Yeah, you stick around, preacher man. You're good luck. Well, as a matter of fact, to be perfectly Ooh, honest... Oh, baby, you are fine. Hey, look, I'll be off in about a... How about me and you... Pardon me, can... sir. You should not be talking to this woman in this manner. What would your wife say? Wife, I'm not married anymore. Anymore? Is she deceased? Deceased? You mean dead? I wish she was. I wouldn't be paying all this alimony. We're divorced. Divorced? Oh, I'm very sorry. Sorry? I'm happy. Except for the alimony. She was driving me crazy. People don't understand what I went through with this woman. I mean, dealing with her moods and her demands every day. But the Lord hates divorce. Hey, don't be dumping no guilt trip on me, all right? One out of two marriages get divorced these days. It's not like I'm the only one. Besides, it was her fault. She was driving me crazy. One out of two marriages ends in divorce. This is 50%. Oh, are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. Would you just trust me? We're going to have the best time. OK. <laughs> well, who's going to get the alcohol? Tommy's older brother. Young ladies. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, but I could not help but overhear your conversation, and I am shocked at what you are saying. I could not believe you would want to deceive your parents in this manner. And who are you, mister? And you're also speaking of consuming strong alcoholic drink, which should be forbidden, especially for your age. Right, and so who do you think you are, like our parents or something? Certainly not, but I am someone who has a genuine concern for your welfare, and I am your elder. We should always conduct ourselves with honesty and integrity. All right, look, you know what? I am sick and tired of people telling me what I can and cannot do. It's not like we're hurting anyone, so why don't you just chill out? Scientists are supposed to observe everything they can first, record their observations, and then make public their findings. You need some help, man? I'd be glad to skip school. <laughs> not at present, but thank you kindly for your offer. May I ask if you're familiar with the works of John Anderson? John Anderson? I don't believe I've heard of him. He lived in the late 1800s. Brilliant mind published some valuable information on the art of science and experimentation. We'll have to locate his material. Yes, please do. His discoveries are fascinating. The best part about Mr. Anderson's work is how he relates everything to the Bible. The scriptures are never wrong. Mr. Carlyle. God's holy word is so trustworthy. Mr. Carlyle. Yes? Mr. Carlyle, this is a public school. You can't talk about religion in class. What is this couple doing? Hey, what are you doing, mister? I cannot fathom that this young married couple would kiss in front of a child. What is becoming of them? They're not married. They're just actors in a show. Not married? Come on, mister. Get out of the way. Movie. You must stop this movie! The man on the screen just blasphemed the name of the Lord! There must be some mistake! 
You must stop this movie. This is an abomination. And I just simply mentioned the Bible. I meant no harm by it. And the teacher informed me that she could lose her job over the matter. Well, our nation is no longer built on the biblical principles set forth by our forefathers. We haven't been able to study the Bible in public school for years. We've lost prayer in school since a Supreme Court decision in what, 1962? Children not allowed to pray in school? How unthinkable. Well, we're part of a society that for the most part lives without Christ and his word. Last evening, something very shocking occurred. I, I attended a movie with a group from the church, and the person up on the screen blasphemed the name of the Lord. Unfortunately, that happens all the time. Oh, I, I know because I used to be in the film industry. <laughs> As a player up there on the screen? As an actor? No. No. <laughs> no, I was a booking agent for a theater chain. I was making all kinds of money, the whole package. But I was miserable inside. Well, I say all of that because when it comes to the film industry, I've been there and I know how powerful and influential it is to society. I believe that secular entertainment is one of the biggest tools that Satan uses to mislead people. He, he desensitizes us through it. Murder, violence, sexual immorality, it, you name it. Sin has slowly but surely become acceptable to us because we see it all the time, so it, it's no longer shocking to us. But why were these things ever allowed? Well, frankly, I think that Satan's smarter than we give him credit for. And he's very deceptive. When the movie industry started back in the 30s, it was moralistic for the most part. There was a censor board that regulated what could not could not be shown on the screen. And movie makers were very careful about what they were portraying. And that's when the people didn't realize that the devil won his greatest victory. His greatest victory? How so? Because he got the name and the person of Jesus Christ out of the movies. I mean, the morals were there for a while, but the Lord himself was not. And as people became more liberated with their views, there seemed to be less and less conviction because there was no absolute authority. And that is why people can curse the name of the Lord and they don't even think about it. But how can these movie makers so mock the Lord? Do they not understand that he is the one who created them and gives them their every breath? Mr. Carlyle, it says in the Bible that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. If people don't hold reverence for the Lord, what can we expect? In the third chapter of Paul's second letter to Timothy, Paul warns us about the last days. In verses 1 through 5, the scriptures say that in the last days, men will be selfish, proud, without natural affection for one another unthankful, unholy, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. The list goes on. From what I have seen, the state that this society is now in reminds me of the days of Noah just prior to entering the ark and of Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah. Sin appears to be as blatant and as open now as it was then. Surely these must be the last days that Paul is referring to. And the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ is eminent. The Lord God who created all things appears to have been eliminated from your schools, your government, businesses, attacked in the arts and in your entertainment. And through these amazing inventions of the radio, television, and the movies, the devil has mightily planted sinful thoughts. I am leaving you now, Eddie. Okay, preacher, you take care. I also brought you this. A Bible, huh? Yes, God's holy word. That's all right, preacher. Hey, will you look at this? It's in Spanish. Please read it, Eddie. Wow. Yeah, I'll read it. Yeah, I have your word, Eddie. If Eddie Martinez tells you he's going to do something, he's going to do something. Now, I'm going to read this. I believe you, Eddie. May the Lord speak to you. Yeah, preacher. You're a good egg. Vaya con Dios. Eddie, there's something I must tell you. Jesus is coming back soon. 
The requirement, though, to enter this kingdom is that we must be absolutely perfect and without sin. Well, that leaves me out of that party. <laughs> no one is without sin, Eddie. Not one. All of us face eternal judgment and separation from God. This is why we must receive Jesus Christ into our life as Lord. He is the only one who lived a perfect life and thus became the substitute for our sins. For me too. Yes, for you too. He rose from the dead proving he was God and he wants to save us from the penalty of our sins and give us eternal life. But we must first individually receive him, Eddie. This is what it means to believe in Jesus. Well, uh, you know, no one ever quite explained it to me like that before. God wants us to be reconciled to himself, so much so that he gave his only son to die for us. It is all in this book, Eddie. I pray that you will consider what I'm saying. Yeah. Good night, Eddie. Hey, hey, preacher. Hey, listen, I gotta confess to you something. You know, earlier when I gave you my word that I was gonna read this book, well, I was lying. But that was before. Now I give you my word from my heart that I'm gonna read this book. God bless you, Eddie. Genesis. En el principio creó Dios los cielos y la tierra. Come on. In a hurry to go somewhere? Gentlemen, do not come any closer. You must leave here immediately. There's not much time. Not much time for what? I'm afraid I'm not allowed to explain, but you must leave immediately. Look, we've had enough of your little secrets, Carlisle. I want the truth, and I want it now. Look! You've only been gone for a few moments. Norris, the future. Oh, my heavens, where does one begin? It is incredible. But sin abounds. The Lord is not feared. Morals have replaced Christ, and with liberal teachings. The families are in disarray. No authority, no respect. The world lives without Jesus, while the church seems to be filled with professing Christians who do not follow the Lord they claim to believe. Yes, it appeared to be this way. I was wrong in my thinking. Very wrong, Norris. To separate the authority of Jesus from his teachings is indeed deadly, as I have just witnessed the end result. Yes, it would lead many astray. I'm so sorry I doubted you, my friend. It took great courage to do what you did, and I am forever grateful. We have been given a great privilege. We must use it for good. Yes, indeed. Norris, I believe I was witnessing the last days. Abraham Lincoln said it this way. He says, the best way to destroy your enemy is to make him your friend. At the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, the enemy only comes to do three things. To steal, kill, and destroy the truth. That's what he's trying to do. So now let's travel back in time, 4,000 years, and begin to discover where the history of some of these traditions came from. Matter of fact, let's begin in the old-fashioned way. Once upon a time, a long time ago, there lived a man named Nimrod. Nimrod was the great-grandson of Noah. He was the most popular man on the earth at the time. Matter of fact, he was the king of the then known world. He was responsible for building the cities of, of Babel, and uh, the Tower of Babel, and the city of Nineveh, amongst others. Uh, he created great uh, armies right after the flood. He was full of idolatry and covetousness, drunkenness, and a rebelliousness towards God. But Nimrod married a woman named Semiramis. Now Semiramis and, and Nimrod would became basically king and queen of the then known world. Well at some point Nimrod dies and he became deified. He was the very first person that was ever deified on planet earth and they made him the sun god which ended up being Baal. 
The word Baal in your scriptures can be traced back to Nimrod. So it's an interesting uh, reality of history when you see Baal and Ashtaroth, you're ending up coming all the way back to this story of Nimrod and Semiramis. Semiramis gets pregnant by Nimrod and she gives birth to a young baby boy named Tammuz. Now further down in the story as Tammuz grows and becomes a man, Tammuz actually marries his mother and they have a very uh, sexual relationship and that baby Tammuz and his mother Semiramis is where you get the story of Cupid. Cupid it, during Valentine's Day is how the story of Valentine's Day developed was from uh, Tammuz who married a, a very uh, unbiblical relationship uh, with his mother. Okay back to the story of Tammuz. So Tammuz for 40 years was a tremendous hunter and he took the place of his father ruling the world and had tremendous power but more than anything he was a credible hunter but unfortunately his gift and his skill of hunting caught up with him one day because he was killed during his 40th year by a wild boar every spring uh, the first Sunday after the vernal equinox the spring equinox they had what was called Ishtar's, uh, Ishtar's Sunday and they would have a sunrise service. At the sunrise service, the priest of Ishtar uh, would impregnate young virgins on the altar, and during that same service, they would take the babies that were now three months old from the previous year, and they would sacrifice those children on the altar to Ishtar, and then they would take the eggs of Ishtar, and they would dip those eggs in the blood of those young infants. And that is where we get sunrise services, and uh, that is potentially where we get the dying of Easter eggs. It is also interesting to note that the worldwide universal color of Easter eggs is red. Even the White House, the official color of the White House Easter egg is ruby red. Now, back to Tammuz. Tammuz gets killed by a wild boar. So every year in commemoration, of celebrating the death and the deification of Tammuz, which became the son of God, the son of his father, they would set aside 40 days prior to Easter, in, and they would fast and they would pray, and they would have a giant feast on Easter Sunday, where they would celebrate the, the death and the resurrection of Tammuz. And guess what they would have for dinner on that Sunday evening? You got it, Easter ham. They would kill a boar in commemoration to Tammuz, who was killed by a wild boar. And yes, the 40 days prior to Easter, uh, we call it Lent, or the Catholics call it Lent, that 40 days did not come from, my friends, the 40 days of Jesus in the wilderness. That 40 days was already in place for thousands of years before Jesus even showed up. It comes from the 40 days of fasting and praying for Tammuz before they celebrated Easter. I'm going to give you some of the names and, and what they're most commonly uh, remembered for in these different cultures, and some of you will recognize them immediately. First of all, in Egypt, they were known as Isis and Osiris. In Phoenicia, they were recognized as Asheroth and Baal, the very same Asheroth and Baal that you see in the scriptures. In Greece, they were Aphrodite and Adonis, or Eros, where we get the word erotic from. And in Rome, they were called Venus and Cupid. That's right, that's where we get Valentine's Day from and Cupid. Even in the Far East, listen to this, this is amazing, Cupid was known as Zoroaster. Zoroaster is made up of two words, Zoro, which means seed of, and Asheroth, which is Easter. And so what Cupid actually means in the Far East is the seed of Easter, or the seed of his mother. Okay. God always tries to speak to the Israelites and warn them to stay away from Ashtaroth and Baal. Let's read the scriptures. Judges chapter 2 verse 13 says this, And they forsook Yahweh and served Baal and Ashtaroth. 1 Samuel chapter 7 verse 4 says, Then the children of Israel did put away Balaam and Ashtaroth and served Yahweh only. 
And last but not least, in Romans chapter 11, verse 4, it says, But what says the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Right about this time, you're probably having that thought that I warned you about hit your brain, saying, that's not what it means to me. I celebrate the birth of Jesus, and I put all the focus on Jesus, and I celebrate his resurrection, his resurrection and I want to focus on him. Well, your heart may be to want to focus on him, and you absolutely may do that. But the truth of the matter is, is that it doesn't matter how much we focus, how sincere we are, and how pure our hearts are, it only matters that are we worshiping Him the way that He asks us to worship Him, and is anything that we're doing offending Him? Please keep an open mind as we move through the rest of this history, and some of these symbols, which are very shocking, that you're going to find out how they moved through time and ended up in our Christian churches today. Tammuz and his mother, Semiramis. If you look on your screen, you're going to see Isis and Osiris, or this is Ishtar and Tammuz. Now, some of you may be uh, asking, well, wait a minute, uh, I celebrate Easter, you're talking about Ishtar. Easter is actually the Anglicization of the word Ishtar. In other words, if you say Ishtar in English, it's pronounced Easter. That's how the etymology of that word evolved over time. What I want you to see is I want you to see what's on her head is a crescent moon, and in the center of that crescent moon is the actual sun itself. And so the symbol of power of uh, Isis, or Ishtar, was the crescent moon holding the sun itself, her deceased husband, Baal, the sun god. And you can see the baby there that is nursing from her breast. Ishtar was known as the goddess of the east, the bare-breasted fertility god of the east, or the sunrise, which is why they had the service at sunrise on Easter morning. Here on your screen, you see a pagan carving of the solar deity Baal Hadad, depicted as a disc in a crescent. Okay, You can see the, the half-moon disc there in the center of your screen with the, with the sun that is cradled inside of it. And that is the sun god as well as the, as the crescent moon that, it, that surrounds it. Catholic Eucharist is actually the sun that is inside of that crescent moon, or not. Now, look very carefully at, on the right-hand side, you can see the moon, the crescent moon shaped, holding that sun or that wafer of bread. Here's a close-up of it right here. The crescent moon cradle with the sun-shaped monstrance of the Roman Catholic Church. Thousands of year old. This comes right out of paganism and sun god worship where it was the symbol of Baal and his wife Ishtar. Let's move on to another symbol. This is the symbol of the trident. The trident is a, a, the devil's pitchfork. It really is a symbol of Satan, of the horns of Satan. It's an ancient satanic and pagan hand gesture called the trident. The most famous one, of course, is Neptune's trident. We call it the devil's pitchfork, and that's where it comes from. It's just not a drawing that someone made up. This has history built into it of where these things come from. This is a pagan statue of Jupiter that has been renamed St. Peter, and he's holding up, guess what, the trident symbol. That symbol is a satanic symbol recognizing the power of the gods of the sun. You also see what is baby Jesus, supposed to be baby Jesus, is none other than baby Tammuz. And how do we know it's not Jesus? Because you see trident all over the place. You see the trident symbol in the hand of the infant Jesus, along with the tridents coming out of the statue's head. You'll see three tridents, two coming off the sides of the head and one coming off the top of the head. This is not baby Jesus, ladies and gentlemen. This is a pagan sun god, Tammuz, from the story of Baal, Nimrod, and Semiramis ended up being Cupid in today's Valentine's Day. Even the sacred heart comes right out of paganism. That exact same symbol with the sun disk behind the sacred heart has to do with Baal and Tammuz, the sun gods. And you can see it all over the Roman Catholic Church and even in other pagan religions across the world. And where do we find this eight-pointed star, this solar wheel, this sun disk today? None other than on top of our Christmas trees. Now, I know all of us have been taught that the star on top of the Christmas tree represents the star of Bethlehem 
that the kings came in to find baby Jesus. But unfortunately, the star of the ancient pagan sun gods predates the star of the Christmas tree, the star of Bethlehem, by over a thousand years. They were taking the sunburst and connecting it to what you're going to learn in just a few minutes is the tree of Nimrod. And that is where we get our Christmas tree from and the star that we put on top. If you look carefully, you can see there is a tremendous significance and a similarity between the sunburst and the star that we put up there today. Here's the sun disk proudly displayed on top of Christmas trees in, in a mall. Matter of fact, this one doesn't even hide the fact that it's not a star, it's the sun. In the middle of winter, at this winter solstice, December 25th. That's right. That's where we get December 25th on Christmas Day, where we say that Jesus was born. Why did we choose Jesus being born on December 25th? Where did that date come from? Very simple. Jesus was the Son of God. Tammuz was the son of the gods. He was the son of his father, Baal. And so the pagans, which early Christianity came right out of paganism in Rome, they were already worshiping the sun god on Sunday in Rome, which is where we get worshiping on Sunday from. It used to be that all of the early Christians worshiped on Saturday, but it was changed to Sunday because all of the pagans worshiped the sun god on his day, Sunday, and they worshipped him on his birthday on December 25th. So naturally, when Jesus came into the picture and uh, Constantine supposedly got saved in the 300s, they compromised to make it easier for people to convert to Christianity by making Jesus' birthday on the same birthday as, as the sun gods that they were already used to celebrating. And that's where we get December 25th from. And so what we're going to show you right now is an actual clip or a short movie of a montage of different videos that we've discovered of where they still make this celebration, still celebrate this, all around the world where they, they literally glorify the demonic part uh, of Christmas and St. Nicholas and these dark helpers. There are some scholars that believe that the actual song Jingle Bells came from the Krampus Bells that, that were in existence for a long time before that song was ever written. That every time you saw St. Nicholas, he was accompanied by the bells of Christmas, if you will, from his elves. They used to, to have bells that would hang from their necks. And as you heard in the video, they would, uh, you, you would hear the bells as, as they announced themselves into the next town that they were going into. Clear indication of whether or not we can do things just because we are sincere about it. Deuteronomy chapter 12 says this, And you shall destroy their altars, break their sacred pillars, their obelisk, burn their wooden images with fire. You shall cut down the carved images of their gods and destroy their names from that place. You shall not worship the Lord your God with such things. He says, You shall not at all do as we are doing here today, every man doing whatever's right in our own eyes. Some of the most influential Christian leaders in American history were looking for alternatives and refused to celebrate Christmas and Easter because of their pagan backgrounds. Charles Spurgeon said this, On December 24th, Christmas Eve, 1871, look at this quote, We have no superstitious regard for times and seasons. Certainly we do not believe in the present ecclesiastical arrangement called Christmas. First, because we do not believe in the Mass at all, but abort, whether it be said or sung in Latin or English. He went on to say, and secondly, because we find no scriptural warrant whatsoever for observing any day as the birthday of our Savior. And consequently, its observance is a superstition because it's not of divine authority. Ladies and gentlemen, this is one of the most spiritually held up 
uh, pastors of, of all time is Charles Spurgeon. And he himself says Christmas is of no divine origin. It's of no divine authority. And we absolutely should not celebrate it. Why? Because he knew that its origins were in paganism and cultic philosophy. We have, uh, what did all of the disciples do in the spring that just so happens to be the time of Easter? Absolutely, it's called Passover. Luke twenty-two nineteen says this, And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Do Passover. Obviously, Easter was nowhere in the minds of our Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua the Messiah, or his disciples, or anybody for hundreds of years. They celebrated what's in Hebrew called Pesach, Passover every single year, remembering the death, burial, and resurrection of their Lord through that incredible holiday where they used to sacrifice a Passover lamb for the remembrance of the death of the firstborn and, uh, and the freedom from Egypt. But now today they were remembering the freedom from sin, freedom from Egypt being metaphorical by the death of Jesus himself. So they would never have connected Easter with Passover. It didn't exist. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul even instructs us in verse 8. Therefore, let us keep the festival, talking about Passover, not with the old yeast, the yeast of malice and wickedness, but with the bread without yeast, the bread of sincerity and truth. If you want to watch a lot of present true videos that will prepare you in these last days, visit the7thunders.com. You can download a lot of videos or audios for free and watch them and share them with everybody that you can. Spread this video fast as possible on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, every website and every place that you can. Spread the word, spread the word. Jesus Christ is coming. Spread the word, spread the word. The Sunday law is near. Go and tell the revelation story. As the fire in the wind burning up the field. There's the devil coming as an angel of light. Trying to change God's law. The prisons and the mountains will see the sign of God's protecting arm, the face of Jesus. Oh, spread the word, spread the word, soon probation's closing. Cling to him, rest in him, Jesus, Prince of Peace.